Welcome to Our Voices. African countries are trailblazers in the promotion of women to leadership positions more than many countries around the world. Four of the top ten countries with the highest percentage of women in parliament are in Africa. The continent's leading pan-African body, the African Union Commission, is the only continental organization in the world that has achieved gender parity, 50% women and 50% men in the executive leadership. Yet despite this significant progress, many countries still have ways to go in enabling women to sit at the decision-making table. On today's program, we examine what can be done to remove barriers that are keeping women from exercising their leadership potential. We will also look at the role of money as a path to the decision-making tables in government. Welcome to the conversation. I am Orian Itangishaka. With my colleagues here, Ian Bior and Heidi Adams Fitzpatrick, and joining us at the table is Ambassador Liberata Mula Mula, former Tanzanian ambassador to the U.S. She's the current Associate Director and Visiting Scholar at the George Washington University's Institute for African Studies. Ambassador, thank you so Welcome. much for being with us. <laughs> thank you. Thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> Female underrepresentation in politics continue to be a problem in Botswana, where only three women won seats in the 57-member National Assembly in the country's general elections a few weeks ago. Activists say the African country has bias against women in both its electoral system and its culture. From Botswana, Mkondisi Dube has more. After the 2014 general election, Botswana only had four elected female members of parliament in the National Assembly. The number dwindled to just three after the October 23 national poll. Women's rights groups blame an electoral system which they say discriminates against women. We live in a very patriarchal society, a society that intentionally or unintentionally we teach people that a male person is a better leader than a female person. So we have a lot of women, even those that are capable at times doubting themselves as to whether they can do this. Yeah, number, Currently, only 5% of women in Botswana hold political positions far from the 30% goal set by the regional bloc, the Southern African Development Community. Men hold the vast majority of political seats, even though 55% of Botswana's voters are women. In politics, we're talking power relations. Women would rather give way to men and then stay behind this man and praise the man, elude for the man and do things, fundraise for the man. But uh, come to think about it, they can also do the same for themselves. A study by women rights group Emang Basati found that the electoral system does not favor women who also face cultural barriers. Three African observer missions expressed concern about the low number of female candidates in Botswana's latest poll. The 2019 elections represent a downward shift in the representation of women in political leadership, particularly at the National Assembly level. In response, President Mukwezi Masisi has promised to appoint more women to the National Assembly through a constitutional provision which empowers him to do so. Unfortunately, very few women uh, that we as a party were able uh, to put uh, forward. But uh, thankfully, the constitutional provisions that allow for the election of specially elected members of parliament will be very heavily skewed towards the women folk being so elected. President Masis was sworn in for a fresh five-year term in Habron on November 1 and appoint six additional members to the National Assembly. Mkondi Sidube for VOA News, Haboroni, Botswana. So that's one example in one country of the different challenges women go through on the continent trying to get to the decision-making table. Ambassador, in the challenges that you're seeing on the continent in uh, different places, what are the major ones that you're seeing? Yeah, let, let me first start. I don't know how much time I have, but to thank you for this program. Uh, because as they say, um, women don't need voice, but they need to be listened to. Mm -hmm. And uh, we know in African countries, especially for this year, there have been so many elections. But um, you mentioned about the last one. The recent one in Botswana, it is still a, a male-dominated. However much we have 
in recent years we have succeeded. We have seen how the women have come up. We have, we have had presidents, we have had um, members of parliament leading many other countries, many developed countries. But then they say the worst enemy, <laughs> one, the prejudices. Right. It's been very difficult to change the, the belief that women cannot lead. And if you have seen um, traditionally, in, which is still predominant, you see always men walking ahead of women. So that is even in politics. It's like we are the leaders, you are the followers. Mm -hmm. It's so, so baked into mm -hmm. our culture at so many, yeah. so many levels of it. Um, Ambassador, where in your view can women be most effective in, in the many echelons of politics? Mm -hmm. uh, where in political life have you seen or, or have you found women to be most effective? I've, in fact, let me say that women, when they are given any opportunity, they become very effective. Mm -hmm. right? Because what we are looking for here, thing one is they will become effective if they are part of the decision makers. But also we have seen historically that the women have been effective in their own comfort way as business women, as market right. women. Because everybody says, if you want even to look for the engine for Boeing, go to the market. Right. <laughs> you find the women, they even <laughs> say the Boeing. So mm -hmm. this is, I mean, of course, has been seen as a, something that is not empowering, but it still it is. In Liberia, the president Ellen Johnson Sarif would not maybe have been elected if it was not for these women from the market, mm -hmm. the market right, women. Right, right. So yeah. that's why I think the power is, mm -hmm. but if you can make it mm -hmm. an, an activity, uh, something that would empower these women in terms of having uh, a good income, being able to use that, whatever they earn from the market, and be able to, to improve their livelihood, so to be able to support their, their families. Right. It, it is something that is good. Right. So the power but isn't necessarily is. in politics. It, it is not necessarily in politics, but if you are not in politics, because that's where decisions are made even to, to establish a market for women, mm -hmm. it is made in politics. Right. It's made by somebody who is, uh, would put mm -hmm. a budget to open up a place where the women can do business. That's true. Right. It is in politics where you have uh, some of these decisions that are being taken contrary to what the women actually I try, they want to do. Ambassador, you're giving us so much to think about. Thank you so much. And for those of you at home, we want to hear from you too. What do you think can be done to bring more women to the decision-making table? And is political inclusion the most effective way to make change? Let us know on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Our handle is at VOA, our voices, or send us a message on WhatsApp. That number is on your screen. Now, Ambassador Mola Mola, as you were saying before, women have made gains across the continent. We have in Ethiopia, we have Maiza Shanafi, the first Supreme Court president. Um, we also have Asma Mohammed Abdallah in Sudan, who is the first female foreign minister. Um, but there, but I want to ask you about the so-called ceremonial post. Um, as you know, Saleh Work Zeude, she was appointed as Ethiopia's president last year. And we also have Sarah Kugan Wugwelwa in Namibia. Um, she is the prime minister there. When these two women were appointed, it was said that these are largely symbolic and they, they really don't have any power to affect any change. Is there such thing as a symbolic post um, when women are put in those positions? I don't think there's anything you can say symbolic. First of all is how they came to do those positions. Mm. One, they come to those positions in their own right. They qualified women, but also like uh, in Ethiopia, the first president was elected by the old parliament, mm -hmm. <laughs> although nominated by the party, but the old parliament mm -hmm. considered to that. So it is, it's, that gives uh, even the power. Absolutely. Yes. And we don't hear that it's symbolic when men are put in those positions, oh, now do we? Of course. But also in our countries, you mentioned about the prime minister uh, in Namibia. The, in Tanzania, we have the president, we have the prime minister. The prime minister is also most powerful in terms of the local. Well, because they say that every politics is local. Mm -hmm. right. So it's how, it's how you position yourself. Right. So of course the women, they could also, because of the prejudices we talk about, about the patriarchy and all those obstacles that you have and the intersection, mm -hmm. they always face. But I always call on the women. Don't mm -hmm. allow yourself to be brought down by those challenges. Mm -hmm. Use the space effectively. 
use the opportunity effectively and be seen to be doing it. Nobody will give it, and if you have been given, you are lucky. Use it, use it. Of course, as you said, men, they will always not, because our bar, the bar for the women is always raised high. It's very high. It's very, very high. And it's unfortunate because it seems like if one woman fails, then yeah. that casts a doubt on a lot of other women, which men don't have to go through that. Yeah, because that's also what puts the pressure on these women mm -hmm, right. <laughs> when they're in these positions of power. Mm -hmm. It's like, oh my God, whatever little thing I do, the, this tenacity mm -hmm. of proving yourself is always that is up to you. Right. But I'm saying, for women, you don't even have to prove, to prove yourself. You know it, you can do it. Mm -hmm. You have the skills, you have the education. I mean, what we are, I mean, also one of the obstacles is like, you don't have, because many, many of, of the women, mm -hmm. women have no education, are not literate, mm -hmm. but then you have the skills, mm -hmm. you have education. Mm -hmm. Don't be, uh, don't allow yourself to be brought down right. because of those prejudices. So right. for me, I always look at it from that perspective. Right. Yes, the men will always say whatever they have, but if you entertain it, and then you allow the right. of it, you will always be seen as not effective. And you have said in some of your addresses that yes. it's not about the title that you hold, but yes. it's about what you do it's, as a leader. It's true. That makes you a leader. It is true. It is true. It's not about the position. Of course, the titles give, give you a place. Like, mm -hmm. I am here. Everybody says, oh, even when I arrived, mm -hmm. oh, ambassador, oh, ambassador, you <laughs> arrived. You see, the title, yes, gives you a, a certain class, a certain status. Mm -hmm. But then it's not, it does, does, not, does not mean a leader. It is it's not about being a title. Mm -hmm. it's, it has a lot of attributes of being a leader. So, Ambassador, what have we learned from the women who have made it? We, we have learned, one, the resilience mm -hmm. <laughs> to get there. And now um, there's one, um, this was it's called Betty Drisu. He was a, a former attorney general, a former minister of education of Ghana. She was saying it is a very difficult road to, to get to the top. But it's also difficult when you arrive. Mm -hmm. Because they're always, they're always the first to, to fall. But the women who have made it, in the short time, even if you are there for two, four years' time, like um, the presidents that have been, Joyce Banda and all those, what they have done in such a short time, it's incredible. It's incredible. And Ambassador, it's, it's a... You Fighting corruption. I mean, increasing budgets for the health, for the education, right. water, and so forth. Right. You find, you can see, it's so impactful. And I call it this epic leadership that women shows. Mm. The you epic mentioned, one, you yes. mentioned um, Joyce Bender earlier, yeah. and she was actually um, very vocal about this idea of not just making sure that women get into power or yes. into office, but ensuring that they stay there. Yes. Um, that, that, that is a challenge. That is a challenge because um, the, as women, because even when Ellen Sadio Johnson was leaving, he didn't pick somebody who can succeed there. She said, I'm following the rules, I'm following the constitution, I cannot even pass it on to my vice president because it has to be an open field right. for others to compete. But that's also, that also costs us because the men, they always pick their successors. Right. But for, for women, we just leave it Okay, to the open field because we are always uh, adhering mm -hmm. <laughs> to, to the rules. Mm -hmm. But that has made us not, uh, now we don't have any, I mean, apart from the, the Ethiopian president. Mm -hmm. that, that, that is the only one we mm -hmm. have. Mm -hmm. It's because we, didn't, we don't have this kind of uh, having to... Forward looking. Forward looking, mm -hmm. but also preparing even our successor. We don't, we don't want just to give them on the plate, mm -hmm. but it's, it's, you see, she has a potential. You have a potential. So when I'm looking, I'm saying, yes! Why don't we prepare her? Mm. So, mm. and then you make her visible. Mm. And then everybody would just say, yes, mm -hmm. this She's is next. the choice. She's next. <laughs> but if you just say it will just happen by chance, mm. and my right. choice, it won't happen. Mm. The decisions are made by those in power to right. stay. Well, we have to take a short break. When we come back, we'll examine the role of money in the path to ascension to the decision-making tables in government. We'll be right back. is about more than just sitting here and talking about women's issues it's about listening to them and bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard because our lived experiences our stories and our voices will help shape the next generation
As we look at barriers that keep women from the decision-making table, we question the costs required to get there. Ambassador, could we say that finance is, is the obstacle that's keeping women from getting to the decision-making table on the continent? Yeah, I mean, finance, yes. There are other factors. Mm. But then if you want to get into politics, mm. it is a very hard thing to get in if you don't have money. And I had one of the women politicians telling me, said, Ambassador, she came to my class, and she says, don't let anyone tell you that you don't need money to get into politics, politics or you, you need money. Mm -hmm. So he said, you need both. Mm -hmm. So without financing, you have seen the campaigns. Right. So, I mean, in this country, in our okay. countries, I mean, if you really wanted to do a campaign, mm -hmm. like in Tanzania, the requirements, if you are a candidate, mm -hmm. you need to go throughout the country. And it's not a small country. Right. So to get the nomination signed, the form signed, mm -hmm. so you can either send it by email, <laughs> but then it won't have the same impact. You have people like this men, well-established, they have buses. You see the buses, you see the ten name mm. of the candidates. And helicopters. Helicopters, <laughs> yes. The opposition parties, they'll come with the helicopters mm. and everything. But then, for the women, I've seen those who are presidential candidates in Tanzania being accompanied by a husband mm. and uh, maybe a daughter <laughs> driving <laughs> those kilometers and <laughs> kilometers to get through the country. It's because so, they don't have the finances. Mm. So what should so women do to get more finances? I mean, because we get the finances from potential voters, right? So yes. what do women need to do to get more money from them? Potential voters, but also the, it's, it's how the message, the message you put out, how do we able to attract mm -hmm. even the, the private sector? Because what, that's where the money is. Mm. They say, if we have you as a president, then we know it is also our business. Also, there's also mm, prospering. Mm. But it's not like you're saying corruption money. Right, but yeah. The messaging. The voters, most of them, the majority are women. Mm. Yeah, <laughs> the majority right. of the women, they don't have much money. Right. <laughs> yes. But then, if you are, of course, in the establishment, like the party establishment, of course, there's money. The party sponsors you. Right. If you go, of course, as independent, that's another thing. But I, like in Tanzania, they don't allow independent candidates. Mm -hmm. So you have to be, to be nominated by the party. Mm -hmm. And then the parties, they would put money. But usually they don't. But does this they also don't, prevent... They don't put it for women. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that's where we, we find that there's no level playing field. Mm -hmm. that's, but that's Madam Ambassador, problem. does this also prevent then women from entering into opposition politics? Because we do have a problem with weak opposition uh, parties on the continent. Uh, do women tend to go into um, opposition politics? Uh, yeah, they go when there. they have the resources, or is that the problem that there aren't enough resources? It is, a, it is a problem, but also a solution. Mm. They find the opposition parties as an alternative mm. because when you have these ruling parties, they may be liberation parties, have been they have the old club of women, of men. Mm. So, those the new entrants they don't see the entry point, mm -hmm. but they right. sit in the opposition parties. Mm -hmm. And the opposition parties, most of them I've seen the money they have. They have to put it mm. to rule these candidates to make sure that they win the yeah, seats. Right. So maybe on the government level, yeah. could governments maybe instate uh, an incentive for women, financial incentive, the same way they do quotas? Mm -hmm. Could that help? It will, it will, but then the men will also demand. It said, no, I mean, why, why are you favoring? I mean, I mean, <laughs> why, why, why are you favoring? But then if you, the, especially through the women activists, women movement, they push mm. to make sure that you cannot compare this woman <laughs> to a man who has been established for so long. They have property, they have something to show. They can go to the, work in the bank, get the loan. Mm. The women cannot. So the government can also have this what we call positive discrimination mm. <laughs> by giving them, empowering these women through giving them this uh, more financing. Mm. But even if not giving them money, but it's opening doors to the banks, to the private sector, to, had to be able to support these women. Yes, but I think it's normally with the patriarchal, they, they, it's, they don't It's also do sometimes it true in what, what you believe in, the power of the people, um, of your, your voters. Yeah. And then there are those who believe um, in the power of money because they've seen it work. And, and I think men kind of have that part of the market cornered where mm -hmm. they believe in the power of money. They can see how far money, they That's know right. how far money can get them. Women come in from a sense of, um, and I don't want to generalize here, <laughs> yeah. but they think about, I always think when you talk to women, 
women don't just talk for themselves. They're right. always representing a community right. or their family. You are right. And you are right. there's less individualism mm. with women. So when a woman comes into politics, mm. is she thinking about the community, her constituents much more, mm -hmm. and thinking that's her vehicle and believing that? Whereas, mm. you know, there are men who are in power who can just sit back and say, they know if they just uh, throw money at this. Yeah, it is true because like, if you hear the, when the women are campaigning, it's always about we, 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 mm -hmm. not I. But the men, men is always I. It's about me. It's about, they talk, I mean, they feel about the communities. But as you are saying, I don't know how you'll we'll be able to change this. Mm -hmm. Because in any politics, this is a, uh, if you have no money, mm -hmm. it's very difficult. You could have, of course, what they call IOM, good ideas. You are well organized. But M. <laughs> it's yeah. always I think that determines whether you get it or not money. Well, I, um, I, I have to say, I have to play the devil's advocate. I think that money is the problem, and I think that we have to figure out a way to separate money from the politics, whether it's lobbyists who are using their agenda or campaign finance violations. Um, but if I may, I just want to ask you one last question, because you have dedicated your entire career to diplomacy. Yes. And when you started um, to right now, have you seen an evolution um, in, in, in the way that women are perceived um, as, as they make their way up the ladder? Oh, yes. I mean, we have seen a lot of progress <laughs> from where we started and now, because now there is uh, more acceptance, more recognition. The women are seen as bringing the difference, mm -hmm. for, even for businesses. They think, they think they have now realized that when you have women in the businesses, in, as leaders, as CEOs, the companies do better. Mm -hmm. So it is now, it is with time, this is changing. Because the women, the way they are showing how much they can deliver. Mm -hmm. So that's why I say it's not always good to keep on talking about the challenges, mm -hmm. talk about the vic being victims. Right. I've seen it, I was in South Africa for these women in dialogue. 1,000 plus women, they are all doing things mm -hmm. in their own right, at their own level. They don't mm -hmm. even have titles. So with that movement, mm -hmm. I'm sure it is for your generation. Is that in the former First Lady's event? Yes, yes, the former, yes, uh, Mama Beck is, uh, mm -hmm. she convened, it takes courage to go on this women. But you can see that uh, you will do things different mm -hmm. because it, the, more, the whole point was to have this inter intergenerational dialogue that how can you do it better than we did? So I think uh, now, it is the time we should seize the moment mm. and well, their voices. <laughs> well, we have the voice, of, we need this platform. Of using your voice and seizing the moment, after the break, we'll introduce you to one young woman who made political history in her West African home country and we'll tell you why she wants more African accents in foreign policy. We'll be right back. This is a country that I chose to become a citizen. I didn't have to become a citizen. I chose to become a citizen. I feel like America gave me an opportunity to pursue my passion as an artist. I really believe that clean eating is, is a way to a more successful life or, or a happier life, if, if you want to put it that way. One of the things that helps me wake up every morning is doing better, being better. We grew up poor, and so I'm always focused on helping the working class be able to have a more comfortable lifestyle. I'm passionate about doing justice every day. Um, I oftentimes say that justice is a verb, not a noun. You know, I believe in action and moving the ball forward. You're watching Our Voices. Everyday African women on the continent and in the diaspora are doing extraordinary things. And we highlight their contribution in a segment called Women to Watch. Uh -huh. 
In 2018, 35-year-old Kamisa Kamara made history in her home country. She became Mali's youngest foreign minister and the first woman to hold the post in that nation. Kamara is now one of nearly a dozen women out of 32 ministers in total in Mali's cabinet. She's also the co-founder of the Sahel Strategy Forum, which focuses on peace, security and development across the Sahel. Kamara has worked with the Foreign Service Institute of the U.S. State Department to train U.S. diplomats traveling to sub-Saharan Africa on political security and other issues. And I think my favorite thing about Kamara is actually her worldview. Mm -hmm. She says being an American woman born and raised in France to West African parents, she wants to highlight religious and cultural specificities through her work. And she says her mantra is to enrich foreign policy with, wait for it, African accents. Now, oh, wow. that, that sounds very refreshing, <laughs> right? I just wonder what does an African accent sound like? I can think of at least 12 coming out of South Africa alone. Right. And, you know, around this table, does that disqualify all of us? I technically all these have different... an American accent. Right. So yeah. I, think <laughs> I think we have like a mutt accent in certain places. But, but I think it, it makes a great case for diversity. Yeah. Um, yes. And I think that's what she's going for. Mm -hmm. And it's so great because she's now the Minister of Digital Economy and Planning. And you were talking about this new generation. Yes, of oh, leadership, yeah. yes. And in fact, let me talk about the accent. When I get into either Uber, everybody say, they would ask me, says, oh, you have an accent. Where are you from? I said, you also have an accent. Yes. Yes. <laughs> I do the same. I do the same. <laughs> same. <laughs> At the end of the day, everybody <laughs> has an accent. accent. <laughs> One right accent. Yeah, cool. but that's what gives us identity. That's Correct. Right. Yeah, right. Exactly. Absolutely. The accent in this case of the foreign policy, which has the African identity. Correct. Absolutely. Yes. It's, it's well, not she foreign. Is, <laughs> she is an accomplished young woman, and mm. we want to hear of other accomplished young women across the continent. So tell us who you think is a woman to watch in politics who's claiming her seat at the decision making table. And be sure to watch our voices on VOA's website where you can find the world's top news stories. And as usual, we leave you with a quote, this time from former president of Malawi, Joyce Banda, who used her voice to say, women are risk takers. They put their people first. It's not about the votes. It's about the people who gave them the mandate to lead in the first place. Well, that's all for us this week. We'd like to thank the ambassador Mula Mula Liberetta for, her, for coming today. Thank you. It was a pleasure. And please keep up the good work you are doing at The Voices. Thank, thank you so much, Ambassador. Great to have you. Thank you. Thank you. As always, we thank you for watching. Good day.